Anna, I think you are the first. We've met uh, with Anna uh, at uh, the Bologna University uh, more than 10 years ago. And we planned to have research on abstract concepts since 2010, I think. But uh, somehow Anna got much more ahead. So you can see that we are still emerging. <laughs> and Anna, so the floor is yours. Yeah. So thank you so much, Joanna, and everybody for uh, making this possible. I think it's a great occasion. I'm going to talk about some ideas on abstract concepts. So a brief outline of what I'm going to talk about. Um, I wanted to speak very briefly about our proposal a theoretical framework, according to which abstract concepts are grounded in the social dimension, and speak very briefly in the first part of the talk of studies we have already performed. But then in the second part of the talk, I want to focus on uh, what we are working on, so open studies and eventual possibilities for collaboration. Um, so first of all, uh, we distinguish between abstraction and abstractness. So when we categorize, for example, animals, there is some kinds of abstraction. We instead focus more on abstractness. We have focused so far on abstractness, that is on abstract concepts like freedom, fantastic, truth, etc. We do not think that there is a discontinuity between, uh, th there is a dichotomy between concrete and abstract concept. Rather, we think that they are related and there is a continuum. Uh, but we think that uh, the most abstract and the more concrete concepts are grounded in a different way. So concrete have objects as reference. Uh, abstract are more detached from the five senses, even though interoception might play a major role. Abstract concepts are more complex. They are more variable across uh, participants, across situations, and they are more heterogeneous. So they have less common features compared to concrete concepts. Uh, actually, you mentioned embodied and grounded view. We started from this, arguing that embodied and grounded view have provided a lot of evidence on uh, concrete concepts, but not on abstract. So we think it's an, a challenge to address this for us, uh, not only for embodied and grounded view, but also for all views, because it's a very sophisticated and important human ability. So we think it's really important to, to address it. Um, we have some criticism pertaining embodied and grounded view. They focus more as well, they didn't focus much on language and abstract concepts. They thought that language and words were somehow only pointers to objects in the world or they provided a shortcut to meaning, whereas we think that words uh, and, uh, can uh, be inner tools and social tools that facilitate social interaction that uh, change our cognition. And we think this is important in particular for abstract concepts. So this is basically the framework. And so we have proposed this view according to which words are um, um, social tools. Uh, that has some four tenets. The first tenet is that all concrete and abstract concepts are grounded in sensory motor experience, but for abstract one, linguistic and social information is more important, first during their acquisition. So for example, this is how a boy might acquire the concept of ball. It might be quite easy because he has experience with the object. Whereas it must be more difficult with a girl to learn what is fantasy without having the help of someone else. So basically the idea is that linguistic and social acquisition are more important for abstract concepts. This influences their brain representation. And this implies that during also use of abstract concept language, we, we activate language and we might activate the embodied counterpart of language that is the mouth. The fourth tenet pertains to linguistic variability. That is, we think that because, um, because abstract con for abstract concept language is so important, they might be more variable across languages. And this might open interesting possibilities for collaboration. Um, so what we did in, in the last years, we had uh, a bunch of studies showing that uh, the mouth is involved during abstract concept processing. Um, here, I have a list. So uh, many studies in which we found that if we respond, for example, with a microphone or with a device to hold in the mouth, 
we are facilitated with abstract concepts, but, but not with concrete ones. With, this means that we activate language. So we are facilitated in uh, tasks mimicking conceptual authorization, in tasks pertaining different kinds of processing. We are not facilitated in lexical decision, but we are facilitated in recognition tasks, et cetera. So basically, uh, the idea is that the mouth and the language is important for abstract concepts. We also have a lot of interference tasks uh, with words. For example, if you chew a gum during processing of abstract concepts, you find them more difficult. Uh, if you pronounce a syllable, um, so um, articulatory suppression, while processing abstract concepts, you find more difficult. If you are um, a baby and you uh, use the pacifier for long, you might find uh, you might find processing of abstract concepts. You might it might take more time to process abstract concepts than if you don't. So all these studies seem to show that uh, language is crucial for abstract concepts. This is one direction of research we have um, yeah done in the last years. Another direction always related to this is, as I said at the beginning, we don't think that abstract concepts are uh, something um, a whole, but there are different sorts of abstract concepts. So here we did an Italian database of abstract words. Um, we asked participants to rate a variety of dimensions related to abstract concepts, the more classical ones like imageability, abstractness, concreteness, contextual availability, but also novel ones like body object interaction, five senses, hand, mouth activation, interoception, metacognition, etc. And we found that abstract concepts are those that are acquired later, that are acquired more linguistically, and for which this is an important point for us. Uh, we call it this notion social metacognition, for which we need more the others. Um, okay, on this basis, we distinguished. Uh, different kinds of abstract concepts. So we four class, we have four clusters. Emotion, inner states that are more characterized by inner grounding and sociality. Spiritual, philosophical, like belief, which are more abstract compared to the other abstract concepts. Physical, spatiotemporal, and quantitative, which are more concrete, more sensory motor grounded. And self and sociality, again, that um, in, uh, activate more inner grounding. So different kinds of abstract concepts and the further studies we are making are based on, on that. For example, this is one example of a study in which we ask participants to evaluate the difficulty of concrete and abstract words with an interfering task. Uh, in one case, for example, they had to chew a gum to see activation of the mouth and the other to, to uh, determine whether they um, to determine whether, whether they were good in um, uh, detecting their heart beating, which is a task typically activated for, typically used in interoception research. And we found that in the case of abstract concept, what is particularly important is interoception as and activation of the mouth. So again, uh, grounding in emotional experience, interoceptive, more, the emotional interoceptive experience and uh, gum chewing. So far, this is, what we have done so far, but now we think that we have to go one step further and this opens many possibilities for collaboration. So we think that it's important to study abstract concepts in concepts and during their use. This is something that Larry Barcelo has said in a recent article. We, we need to study them in situated interaction. Um, so uh, we are doing some joint action tasks. We are trying to study abstract concepts in conversations minimal conversation so far, but we would like to expand it also. And we are doing some cross-cultural studies. Over across the studies, we uh, have, um, we study both children and adults. So both in, in both cases. Um, so let me start with joint action. Um, what, so what we think, we think that when we process abstract, con abstract concepts, we are more uncertain on their meaning. So we feel, um, we feel the need to search for this meaning. This might explain why we, it takes longer to process them on one side. On the other side, we think we might need more others. Uh, this is something we call social metacognition. And we think it can explain the mouth activation. So we activate the mouth because maybe we prepare ourselves to interact with others. 
So we test, and also if we ask people uh, how much you need the others to understand the meaning of, an, of a concept, uh, this social metacognition is very important to define abstractness. So this is a recent study in which, which is under review, but it's open, so to say, uh, in which we tested this hypothesis. So in order to understand abstract concepts, we need more the others. Very simple task, a, a concept guessing task. Participants were presented with images and they had to guess whether they, the words to which they refer, concrete and abstract words. Uh, they had a different experimenter for a concrete and an abstract block. Then they had um, a joint action task. Uh, important, the experimenter gave them suggestions. So if they didn't guess, the experimenter gave them some cues to guess the concept. Second part, an interaction task, joint action task. They did this interaction task, this joint action task with an avatar. And they were told that the avatar um, sometimes was, the avatar was guided by each experimenter. So they had one separate avatar for concrete and one for abstract concepts. Notice that in the case of abstract concepts, we hypothesized that they needed the other more. So the hypothesis is that if they need more the other in the guessing task, they were told that a further guessing task will follow the joint action task, then they will rely more on the other, on the inter interactive task. And so we measured, we measured a synchrony in movement in this joint action task. And indeed, we found that in the case of abstract concept, there is smaller grasping asynchrony, so a better performance in the case of abstract concept. So basically, the idea is I need more the other person, so I move more synchronously with him or her, because I need more him or her to understand abstract concepts. So, so this is one possible direction. Other studies, we are, they are open. I'm not going into detail. I'm saying just the general idea. Uh, we are doing some studies with children and thermal imaging, and we have some preliminary evidence uh, with children who perform a lexical decision task, five, six year old children. We found that with abstract concept, there is a more intense physiological activity, which is compatible with the idea that with abstract concept, they need more, they need to rely on others more. Um, so these are studies on interaction. We do also some studies in conversation on conversation. It's not a real conversation, it's a minimal conversation. So basically we present participant sentences, written sentences. It was an online study due to COVID. Um, sentences, and we ask them to respond producing a written sentence, simulating a conversation. So an example is I made a cake. And they might, uh, I thought about destiny and what do they answer? And so, do you believe in fate? Destiny doesn't exist, et cetera. Or I make a cake delicious with chocolate, et cetera. And then we code these concepts according to a variety of dimensions, uncertainty expressions, number of questions, type of questions, et cetera. We don't have, I don't have data so far, but our hypothesis is that uncertainty will be higher in the case of abstract concepts. Participants will ask more questions. We are doing similar studies with, um, in which participants are asked to create a post on social networks with concrete and abstract concepts to see how, which are the differences in this case. Other direction, so I, I, I say only the, the general direction. Another direction, as I said, we think Inner speech is very important for abstract concept. Be why? Because we need to monitor ourselves more. So uh, we have some studies on articulatory suppression, and we are we have some open studies on mind wandering. So suppose you have a very boring task, like you have to wa watch pictures and words, and to decide whether a picture is a square or a circle. But the circle appears very very rarely. When there is a circle you have to press a button. Your mind wanders. Does this happen more when the word associated to the picture is abstract or concrete? So we are studying this. Um, other areas open for collaborations. We are investigating abstract concepts and cultural differences. So we have a 
some cross-cultural studies. This, for example, is a sorting study in which um, Federico Darol uh, made an app for a tablet and participants do a very simple task. They drag, um, they do a sorting task, dragging words inside boxes of them, inside different, a different number of boxes, two, four, six, three number of boxes. And they insert the category level. Uh, so far we have participants from Italy, Israel, and Iran, so quite different cultures. And we want to see whether there is a higher variability both uh, between participants and between cultures in the case of abstract concepts. And we have preliminary data that go in this direction. For example, here there are preliminary results of a PCA with uh, concrete concepts. Uh, as you see, Italy, Iran, and Israel versus abstract concepts. You see there is much more variability across participants and across cultures. So we would like to study this more. Other issues, other issue related, related to this. Cultural differences related to specific kind of concepts. For example, we have some studies, Claudia Matsuka is working on this, on gender. So the concept of gender, is it abstract, is it concrete? Does it, is it flexible? Is it not flexible? Very simple task, free listing tasks. So writing words associated with gender. And the first study was on an Italian sample. This is published. We found that, um, we found that depending on your gender identity, sexual orientation, German norm gender normativity, you produce different words. So for example, normative individuals rely more on, use more words like male, female, use more opposition like male, female, man, woman, whereas non-normative individuals use more aspects like queer, fluidity, etc. In another study, always on gender, we compare different cultures. So we compare, for example, Italian and Dutch cultures. And again, feature listing on the concept of gender. Uh, Italian not progressive, uh, um, Holland more progressive in gender related issues. We found indeed that Italians focus more on abstract social cultural features, discrimination, politics, power, whereas Dutch participants more on concrete elements like hormones, breasts, genitals, etc. Would be in interesting to, uh, to address this in further studies. So the, uh, these are the analyses. Okay. Um, another issue, um, this is one of the last, I think. Um, Another issue, um, always related to the issue of conceptual flexibility, we'd like to collaborate on this. Uh, we did some study on COVID, obviously. Um, so starting from the idea that COVID is a brand new concept. So uh, we didn't know it before COVID emerged. Um, and uh, it has probably reshaped our conceptual representation. So we have an ongoing study. Um, we collected data during the first Italian lockdown on many Italian participants on many different concepts. And uh, again, feature listing. And we found that um, participants were asked to produce five words. And we found basically that um, COVID has reshaped our conceptual representation of illnesses. So um, there is not anymore a distinction between severe illnesses like tumor, for example, and mild illnesses like flu, but um, COVID has reshaped this organization. And we would be really interested in addressing this. How, I, I'm not going into detail, but here, for example, is an example of a network analysis. So of the pairs that co-occur more often and um, uh, related to COVID, this is produced by Italian participants. For, for example, these are the most common, uh, commonly produced words related to a variety of illnesses, COVID disease, virus, tumor, fever, and flu. And we found, for example, that COVID is represented mostly in terms of fear, whereas in the other cases, uh, other dimensions appear. So I'm not going into detail. Um, uh, so my last point was conceptual flexibility. Conceptual flexibility, we study also in relation to populations. For example, I don't know, we have this study with preliminary results showing that the representation of abstract concepts 
changes during pregnancy. So we have a study on with pregnant women, uh, online study on pregnant women, showing that um, showing that in, um, they um, conceive differently abstract concepts, and particularly uh, they think that their in, uh, judgment of interoception increase during pregnancy. So to go to to summarize and to go to the point. So basically, I've tried to summarize what we did before and what we want to do now. Uh, we are basically working, trying to work more on abstract concept and social interaction, starting from this idea of social metacognition. So because abstract concepts are more complex, I need the other more, so I need to rely on them more. We try to use some interactive tasks and to capture concepts more during their use. And we try to uh, focus on conceptual dynamics and conceptual flexibility. So to see how concepts, not only abstract, but only concrete, vary across contexts, groups, cultures, language. And also, in this respect, we do a lot of cross-cultural studies. So I think that these are possible areas where we can find, uh, we can find ways to collaborate, and it would be great to find ways to collaborate. So I'll go back to my outline. So I try to define abstractness. I spoke about the theoretical framework we proposed. I said that so far we, we work more on language activation, mouth activation, and kinds of abstract concepts. And now we are working on more on social interaction, conversation, cross-linguistic studies, and conceptual flexibility. I went very fast, but just it was a choice to give you an idea of what we have open. Uh, here I wrote Marie Curie ITN because, um, yeah, we one of one of the idea was to develop maybe uh, these ideas within this project in order to build a Marie Curie. We spoke about it with you with Joanna in previous moments, and Thank you. I think I'm done. Thank you, Anna, so much. Uh, it's uh, really uh, a whole um, great range of issues that you are you are tackling, and uh, definitely I can see that uh, that we connect on so many levels. But uh, first, I I would like to let, give the floor, perhaps to our guests on YouTube, if there are any questions. We had to condense our presentations. I know it's not easy to, to fit your 10 years of work or even more into 20 minutes, uh, but uh, uh, we have to because th the form of the meeting is, is, is uh, such that uh, you know, long meetings uh, online are very difficult, but we are always there to, to help and to, uh, to contact. Uh, okay, there is a question uh, from YouTube a PhD student at Aarhus University. Um, could you say a bit more about what do you mean by inner grounding? That was my question as well. Uh, excellent uh, remarks on interoception. Um, okay. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, so inner grounding, I'll, I'll go to one of the slides to give you an idea. Um, Okay, so basically um, I, I introduced inner grounding here. So I, I make an example to, to, to clarify. Uh, in the case of this study, for example, we uh, asked participants uh, to rate uh, whether abstract concept activated interoception, metacognition, uh, also social metacognition and emotions. And uh, actually, in this, it, um, this uh, PCA analysis, we found that this dimension um, form a component. Uh, and one component, we, we call this component inner grounding. Um, we think that in the case of an abstract concept, you need to rely more on uh, inner grounding. That is, on one side, you are more sensitive to interoceptive. To the interoceptive dimension. On the other side, you use more metacognition to monitor um, 
to monitor uh, your knowledge. And on the other side, in a grounding, you use more in a speech. In a speech can be an instrument you use to monitor your knowledge. I don't know whether I answered. Maybe just a follow up to this question uh, is the question about emotions. If, uh, if the, this inner grounding component is somehow stronger, how could we study that? Uh, how could we study that? Can you repeat, Joanna? Sorry. I was just wondering, you know, because I wanted to add, uh, ask at bottom, but we can we can skip that uh, because the interception seems uh, to be more connected with emotional concepts, abstract concepts, but are names of emotions. And I was wondering if there is a difference there, for example, in inner speech, because you don't need inner speech when you feel something really. Uh, but yeah, can... uh, I agree. I agree. I, I think we, we think that um, uh, there might be a distinction within abstract concepts. So more emotional ones are more embodied and less abstract, so to say. So in that case, we think that inner speech and metacognition might play a less important role uh, because you rely more on interoception. Mm -hmm. And this is actually what we also found here. You see that there is... Um, um, that more emotional concepts are um, activate more um, interoceptive aspects. So I think the two might be disentangled. So interoception on one side and uh, metacognition on the other side. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. So um, now we have uh, a question from uh, our room, uh, Christian, you, you had a question. Yes, uh, I hope you can hear me. Um, yeah. So thank you, uh, Anna. This was uh, an amazing uh, tour de force of uh, of theory and studies. I was wondering. Yeah. So it seems that uh, you're kind of quite consistently uh, talking about uh, abstraction as you could say a property of concepts or even of words. But could you imagine that uh, actually? people could be using words, but having very different levels of abstraction when it comes to the representations that they, they are associated with, right? So, so one person could be using a fantasy, having a very vague, very or very abstract kind of representation of, of the meaning of that word, while someone else could maybe have, you know, a, a different level of abstraction. So, so do you, uh, is that kind of a component somehow in your research that, 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 uh, words may not always kind of be associated with a distinct level of abstraction per se, but different people might be, you know, having different uh, levels of abstraction in their kind of representations that are elicited by, by the use of people. Yeah, uh, I, I totally agree, Christian. I, I think that one study that addresses this is the study on gender. So in the study on gender, somehow, what do we show? What do we show that the same concept, the concept of gender, is conceived differently depending on the population, for example? So, if you are, uh, I don't know, if you are heterosexual, you conceive it at a certain level of abstractness. If you are not, at a different level of abstractness. If you are, um, what is interesting is also that, for example, in a more conservative culture, like in. in, in um, in relation to the gender concept, uh, like Italy, you um, you conceive it more up in, at a more abstract level, whereas in a more uh, progressive culture, you conceive it uh, in more concrete terms. So I think that that that's a very interesting point, and I think it would be interesting to develop this issue also in relation to individual differences. So if that is, so I agree. I think this connects also to a question um, that was asked uh, by uh, Professor Jurevich at the, on the YouTube, and uh, but she asked also a very interesting question, which is also close to my heart. What is, what is the relationship between the abstract concept and its sign, like a word, verbal or nonverbal? And can we say that we sort of have more meaning in the concept that, that in the sign, how to disentangle the, the two? That's a difficult. That's a difficult issue. That's a difficult issue. 
And uh, I, I think, uh, yeah, this is part of the work we can do in this project. So when, when it's a very difficult issue, also the relationship, addressing the relationship between concepts, abstract concepts and abstract words. So uh, in some cases, we use them interchangeably because we often uh, study and address abstract concepts through words, but that's not uh, so straightforward. So I agree that it's it's a problematic issue, and I, as as abstractness, the definition of abstractness is problematic. So we are dealing with very subtle and, and um, distinction that are difficult sometimes to, to disentangle. So. I think this is a perfect meeting point because between us and Professor Jurevich, please join us in, in this effort. Um, and also, uh, well, maybe one of the reasons why our title was so long, you all remember, right? When we were struggling to make a shorter title and to choose between the concepts and words and we were going back and forth and back and forth and Angelo said, no, just put them both. <laughs> and, and he was of course right, because this is the one of the major problems. And uh, yes, let's, let's uh, do that. And I hope that also, uh, you could see that the expertise that we are gaining in our cognitive science uh, program are very fit to, to maybe join your analysis uh, in, um, of concepts in, in different cultures. We have students with a lot of expertise in uh, linguistic, uh, uh, computational linguistics and, uh, and uh, representing languages in vector spaces and so on. So I hope that a lot of this can be merged. Okay, Anna, thank you so much. We yeah, thank you. Thanks a lot. We have just touched. That was just a brief uh, overview. Of course, you have all the publications listed, and uh, the presentation and the recording will be available. So do contact us if you have any any ideas.